Chapter 20 is where we're going to start. We'll be taking just a little bit of a survey of a couple of different scriptures, but Matthew 20 will be our primary focus, especially verse 28. And we've been asking the question throughout the month of September about serving. I mean, you know, it's all about service. How, when, where, and why? What's the purpose? Why do we serve? And as we've looked through it, we come to the conclusion today where we're going to specifically look at the how do you serve and how do we serve aspect of it. Later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ephesians chapter 4, but in verse 16 in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, every part, talking about each individual member within the body of the church, every part doing its share, causing growth of the body. And so when we look at the aspects of serving and why and how and all of those different things, our central focus has got to remain in that very text that the purpose of it all is to cause the growth of the body. We are all to be adding and supplementing to the body in some way, shape, or form that it causes it to grow. And so when you look at the how do you serve, if you're doing something that does not cause growth, then you're taking away from the church. You're taking away. And so today as we look at the text, I want you to refine the way that you see service within the body and to see exactly how God wants to use you and where he wants to use you. One of the greatest travesties within the Christian faith is that many people claim a relationship with Christ, but nothing in their lives reflects his presence or something greater within them. And one of the most awesome ways that we can exemplify Christ within us is our service to others. The way that we work and do for others. And that's what this is all about. That's the why, that's the reason, that's the how, truthfully, is all through Jesus is how we serve. And so I, I want to ask this question because it burns within me. Do you know how many people you could win to Jesus if you would truly just serve him in the capacity that he has saved and created you to be? Could you imagine how many people you could lead to Jesus just by living out your faith instead of hiding it away and truly living it out? And I think through this text today that it should help us to see those things and ultimately help us see exactly what God wants to do with you in your life. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but I didn't put it in the bulletin. I didn't put it in the announcements, but I wanted it to be a little bit of a surprise. But at the end of the service today, we're not just going to talk about being able to serve. At the end of the service, I'm going to ask that everybody go downstairs into the fellowship hall where we have tables that are set up with different ministry opportunities. So not only do you get to hear the message and what God desires of you today, but you'll be able to go downstairs and look and see where God wants you to serve, and you can ask questions and find out information about it. How about that? We get to truly take application of God's Word, not just hearing it today. So we're, all, we're going to put it all together. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 through 28. And if you found your place, if you would stand with me for the honor, as we honor God in the reading of his word. And so Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, and the text says this, look with me. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm, I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but is, it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when, they, when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called, to them, called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you and praise you for your word. God, we pray that in this moment that you allow it to penetrate our hearts and to see the things that you desire. But God, more than anything, I pray that we leave here with an attitude and a heart toward Jesus and all things. God, he paid the penalty for our sins, not that we might 
just go and die and spend eternity with you, but that we might bring others with us and that we could serve you all of our days here on earth. God, let us live within that resurrection power that you have given and for us to glorify you in all that we do because it is in you that we live and in you that we serve. And so, Father, I thank you for everything that you're going to do today. God, I pray that you reveal lostness. I pray that you reveal sin. And God, I pray that you draw us more near to you today than we have ever experienced. And I thank you and praise you for it all. And ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so I still want to answer the question today, how do we serve? And within the text, I think we can find three distinct purposes and points in how that we serve. And the first one is that we need to reset. We serve by resetting, and that means we need to re-examine where we are. I want to specifically focus on verse 28 in this out of Matthew chapter 20, when Jesus said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so I, I want to ask this question to everybody in the room, and I want you to take a personal reflection for just a moment. And I want to ask you, what is the church to you? What is the church to you? And I want you to reflect and think about it for just a minute. Do you see it as something that's supposed to be giving you something? Is the church supposed to be pouring itself into you? Listen again to what Jesus had to say about himself. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. I think that when we look at the church more often than not, we have the wrong idea of what the church's purpose is. The church is a place for us to come together and serve, not a place for the church to serve us. We don't come in here with our plate every day and say, fill me up with some of that prime rib. Don't come in here and give me that slab of mashed potatoes on the side. We're here to serve. We're here to give of ourselves for the glory of God. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, but to be served. But he didn't in there. He added, and to give my life a ransom for many. He didn't just say you're supposed to, or I'm supposed to serve, and my, my exemplica, exemplification of serving is to just give of myself. He literally gave all of himself for that. He paid the penalty for your sins with his life. If we're going to use him as the example of what it means to serve, it's going to be a whole lot more than the hangnail off our big toe. We're going to have to get our whole body in there, and we're going to have to give of ourselves. It's not just a partial surrender. It is pouring ourselves out to service for the Lord. If this, if this is where Jesus was and is today, where does that put you? I believe that many people need to re-examine where they are and truly hit that reset button. We need to hit that reset button and see how we're looking at the church and where we stand within the church and what we're doing in the church. How can anyone believe they're following Jesus and not do for him in return? How, how can we claim that we're truly following Jesus and there's nothing about what we do that resembles the things that he did in, on this earth. Listen, we're not Jesus. We're never going to be Jesus. He is the perfect example, but he is the example. He's the example that we are to follow. And if we're going to follow him, then we're going to do the things that he did too. Stop holding out your hands and begging and start following and doing the things that he did. Let's work through some text that supports this. James 2.14 it says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, can it? Absolutely, faith can save us, but our faith leads us to works. There's things that happen when Jesus empowers us, when his Holy Spirit comes upon us. There's work that comes out of us. James is going on to explain that if, someone, if you see someone in need and do nothing, what does it make you? What does it make you do? Do you just keep walking past or do you, do you pour into them? Then verse 17, he goes a little deeper. In James 2, 17, he says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so the question that I want to ask you today, and I think that this is probably the most important thing that I can speak of. Are you alive in Christ today or not? Are you alive in Christ today or not? And it's not, oh, I've got a feeling. It's not, oh, I walked into the church. It's not, oh, anything. If you're alive in Christ, he is going to be pushing you and empowering you to do something that is greater than yourself. It's going to happen. If you've not experienced that, you need to go and look and see if you still got some grave clothes on or not. 
You need to see if you've really come out of that tomb or not, or if you're still caught up in death. Jesus, if you think that he's not big enough to put you into his service, you have not met the Jesus that lives in me. I'm telling you, Christianity, being filled with Jesus, being filled with his spirit, is so much more than showing up for church on Sunday. It is so much more than going to Sunday school. It's even, oh, it's even greater than showing up for some type of event during the week for church-related activities. We feel like we really accomplished something when we hit a Thursday prayer meeting or something, right? No, no. It is literally doing something that's not for yourself. It is giving of yourself. It means that you might lose something when you are in service for Jesus. James is not trying to run anyone into the ground, but he's trying to get your attention. He's teaching that we need to reset our way of thinking. Listen, you could have had this right at one point. You could have been serving and doing the things that you were supposed to, but you might have lost focus. You might have gotten off track. Trains fall off the track all the time, and it seems to be happening more and more, especially around here. But the thing is, let's get our wheels back on the track and let's do what we need to do. We need to hit that reset button. We need to hit it. James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. But this is what he says, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James is saying that you don't have to worry about my faith. You just watch what the Lord does through me and you'll see it. That's why I asked the question in the beginning, what would happen if we truly started living for Jesus? How many people could you lead to Jesus just by your life? Just by what happens through your life? Not by the words, not by telling them, by showing them what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then he concludes in James 2, he says, do you see that faith was working together with his works, talking about Abraham? And by works, faith was made perfect. And so when Jesus came and said he didn't come to be served, that he came to serve, it's being exemplified all the way back in the Old Testament through Abraham. And now after Jesus has been resurrected and he has ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God, James is putting it into true application for us and showing us that our faith is truly made perfect by what God does through us, not by what we sit and soak in. Not by what somebody else has poured into us, but by what God does through us. You cannot sit idle, soak up all of God's word, and never do anything and be used by God unless you truly get up off your feet and let him use you. And I'm not talking about we can be crippled and not be able to go anywhere at all. But God can still use you if you're willing to. Let him. Man, there's so much more to life than I think that we, we truly understand. But let me give you an illustration about this reset. Thursday was a week ago. The cleaning ladies were in here working, and, and they, they, they use that elevator left and right because they're carrying stuff up and down and back and forth. And they come into my office, and they said, Hey, Pastor Chris, we got a problem. So why is it always I get the problems? I ain't figured that out yet. But they come in and say, We have a problem. I'm like, Okay, what you got? They said, The elevator is not working. Maybe I shouldn't tell all of y'all this because you may not get on it anymore. But they said, the elevator's not working. I said, okay, I'll come look at it. So I walked out here. I hit the button, the up button, down button, whichever. It lights up. And I'm like, okay, here we go. I heard it go, you know, it makes that really loud sound when you first push the button. And so it kicks off, and then all of a sudden the light goes off and nothing happens. So what do you do when it don't work? The first time you push the button again, right? Nothing happens. And so I went downstairs. I know the elevator room, the mechanical room's downstairs. That's about all I know about it. I've never touched a thing in there dealing with the elevator. And so, so I open it up, and I look, and I see this big red handle on a box, and there's instructions for reset. And I'm like, okay. I think, I, I think I'm figuring this out. It says, Re to reset, pull the lever, wait 30 seconds, turn it back on, and in about two minutes, it should start functioning again. It should, okay, maybe, hopefully. And so I reached up there and I pulled that red, big red handle. I pulled it down and you can hear everything shut down. I waited, I counted to 30. I gave it an extra 10 seconds because I wanted to be safe. I flipped it back on and within about 20 seconds, you could hear the elevator power up. You know what happened? I went out there and I pushed the up button and all of a sudden the door swung open. I got on, I ain't gonna lie. I pushed the second floor button and got out of it. 
and went upstairs and waited on it just to make sure it was really going to work. <laughs> and then I told him it was working and walked off. I never got on that thing. I just told on myself. But, but the point is this. I hit that reset button. Sometimes we get off track a little bit. But when that elevator resets, you know what it did? It went back to its intended purpose. Maybe that's where we are today. Maybe we've gotten a little off base for where we belong in Christ. Maybe we know what we're supposed to do, but something's gotten a little haywire in there. You know what? The greatest reset button you can happen is right here on your knees in just a few minutes and say, God, I've messed this up but I want you to reset me, restart me, and get me back to where I belong. I want to walk out of here serving you just like you created me to do. I want to get out of the way, and I want it to be all you. It's in your hands, though. What are you going to do? Are you going to, are you going to hit that reset button today, or are you just going to keep on going down that wrong track? This is your opportunity to respond and to do exactly what God has intended for you. Get back to those factory specifications that he gave you. So are you in need of a factory reset today? Have you forgotten what God purposed for you to do? So how do we serve? We gotta start by hitting that reset button. We gotta start by hitting that reset button. And so the second place I wanna talk about, about how we serve and how else we can serve, and the second big word I wanna focus on is refine. We need to refine. And so we gotta find our spiritual gifts. I don't think very many people really know what they are, but we gotta find our spiritual gifts, and this may require a little bit of work. It may require a little bit of effort and some digging to truly understand it. But Scripture helps us to find that place. Romans 12, 6 through 8 is where I want to spend on this. But Romans 12, 6 through 8, and the text says this. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I want you to notice a key phrase in here, though. I kind of had emphasis on it when I spoke it. But listen to this. It's all of the spiritual gifts are prefaced with this phrase. It says, let us use them. In other words, we have to physically make the choice to do it. We, we have to, in our mind, decide we're going to use it. We can't just think it out. We have to truly make the decision to use the gifts we've been given. Some of the most spiritually gifted people in the world have either neither, have neither discovered their gift or they have so resisted the will of God that they have hidden it away for no one else to see. Now, I don't want you to be misunderstood before I really work into this because it talks about teaching and different things. Just because you've been gifted with something to be used in the world does not necessarily mean that's your spiritual gift. Just because you're a teacher does not mean that you're a teacher with your spiritual gifts. Just because it, it just doesn't necessarily work that way. God has given you a very specific gift, multiple gifts for most, to be able to use for the kingdom and for his purpose. And so for those that have never discovered your gifts, what are we to do? And so the first thing I want to tell you is I think Matthew chapter 7 gives us the absolute best perspective of what we're to look at. Jesus said that we ask, that we seek, and we knock. In other words, if we'll petition him, he'll show you. We ask, we seek, we knock. If we, if we ask God what they are, if we seek God's direction, if we knock on the doors in front of us, I'm telling you, you'll receive, you'll find, and doors will be opened. If you have the heart to ask Jesus, he's going to show you exactly what you have and where to use it. But you've got to have that attitude toward him. Did you know that spiritual gift tests, we have spiritual gift tests that you can take that will help you refine exactly what God has done on you so you can focus on those specific, uh, those specific gifts. I don't, so, so I don't know where everybody is, and I'm going to throw this at you right now. If you do not know what your spiritual gifts are, and you've asked God, and you've still not quite got it figured out. There's spiritual gifts tests that will help you find those things. Come see me. I'll point you in that direction so that you can figure those things out. You don't have to be technologically savvy or anything. We can print them out, and you can do them. But, but the thing is, but just like putting your spiritual gifts to use, it takes effort. So does discovering them. You know, for some of us, it's just really easy. We know we, we can see things, but I promise you there's gifts that every one of us have that we don't even realize. We have to dig in there and say, God, show me. We have to read God's Word, and we have to see what He illuminates and how we can go and do those things. And for many, we've just hidden away our gifts. We've put them away, and we're not doing anything with them. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 through 16, 
It says this, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives lights to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do, do you see that? We, we have spiritual gifts. Some of us have these spiritual gifts, and uh, we'll, we'll use this pencil as an example. We have these spiritual gifts, and they're sitting out here for everybody to see. If you could sit high enough, you could see it right now. But this is what we've done with it. We've come over here, and we've hidden it away. God has given them to you for them to be seen by others, not for you to be seen, but for your gifts to be seen that he's given you. Don't miss that point. But instead, they're over here, and nobody has a clue because you ain't doing what you're supposed to do with them. You're afraid of what may happen if you serve the Lord. You're afraid that he may call you to do something. I'll tell you, one of the scariest things ever, I, I, I've shared, I'm not going to beat you with the two and three-year-old stuff, but when I got beyond that and he called me to ministry and I got the phone call to be the children's pastor, you talk about sheer panic running through me. After I got past that first excitement, I, I, listen, I was, I was having a conversation with a man sitting over there when I got the phone call. He may not even remember it, but I was at the church with him when I got the phone call. And the excitement that ran through me when I got it was unparalleled. But then as that excitement wore down just a little bit and the reality of what I was about to do hit me, it got scary. It got flat out scary. That's not a reason to run and hide, though. That's when we turn into the Lord and say, God, this is bigger than me. I don't know what you've got planned with this, but God, I want to do it. I'm going to trust in you to empower me, to pave the way, to give me everything I need. I'm just going to rely on you through it all. That's the whole point of it. But we often hear this talk, this and that, about being a beacon of light, and you should be, but this is about your works in Christ being seen. You're not saved to be hidden from the world. You were saved to be sent into the world to be seen through your works that God prepared for you to do. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How about that? He's telling you that the works and the gifts that are in front of you, that he's already, he's already paved the way. It's not so much about can you do it, it's about will you do it because he's already made the way for you to do it. I love that. God has a plan for each and every one of us, but we've got to employ what he's given us to be able to do it, and we have to trust in him through it all. God's prepared the way. you just got to get on board. Ephesians 4, 7, it says, But to each one... But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Again, we hear, in case we've forgotten, Christ has given us gifts. He's given us gifts. He's given us, everyone in Christ has gifts. Do you know what they are? Do you need to go through that refining process so that they can be exposed in your life? You know, gold, when they pull it out of the ground, what do they have to do? They have to go through that smelting process to get all of the other trash out of it. They will melt it until everything else is gone and it's refined into pure gold. And then you've got the standard. Listen, we may have to go through some things to figure it out. We may have to test some things. We may have to let some things work through us. But I'm telling you, if you will trust in the Lord, he's going to show you what he's given you and how to use those very things. I had a whole bunch more text, but I think for, for the sense of it, listen, we need to discover the gifts that God has given us. We need to live in them and we need to use them for his kingdom and his glory. Let's refine who we are in him. And so the last thing I want to talk about today is how else do we serve? And the last word that I want to focus on is reward. Reward. Reset, refine, and reward. And so this is we strive for heavenly reward, not on the things of this earth. And so Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this, And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. We serve with our heart set on Jesus. That's just it. Our heart has got to be set on Jesus. If you are serving man, you will never, ever be satisfied. I look at this from the perspective, y'all know I have the law enforcement background, and I'll tell you one of the things that I've never, ever, ever been able to comprehend you can go back and you can watch these movies on these guys that have sold drugs, these cartel members, 
these big guys that have millions and millions and billions of dollars. And you look at what they've done, and they do it for years, and they get, they get all the wealth in the world. But when do they ever stop? They never do. They never stop doing it. It doesn't matter how much money they've amassed, they never stop doing it. And why is it? Because you can get all of the things of this world. You can get it all. They understand the risk. They know if they get caught, they're spending the rest of their lives in prison and they have none of those things that they've earned or so they see. But you never get filled. The things of this world will never truly satisfy you. It doesn't, you may, you may enjoy it for a moment, but it's never going to be enough. It's never going to satisfy. It's just not enough. If you're serving man, you're never going to be satisfied. But when you serve the Lord, you will never fail. Now, does that mean that you're going to do everything the right way? Does that mean you're going to see the result that you so desire every time? No. But when you're doing it for the Lord, you cannot go wrong because it's what he has ordained and what he's called for. It's just like sharing your faith. Just because you share your faith with somebody and they don't receive Jesus that day, does that mean that you failed? No. It's the exact opposite. You've done everything that you were supposed to do. You cannot save anybody. It's only by the blood of Jesus. And so if you're serving the Lord, you're striving for a crown, not anybody's approval. And guess what? Guess what you get to do with those heavenly crowns? Does anybody know? You get to lay them at Jesus' feet. But how many of us are going to stand before Jesus, we'll kneel before Jesus when we're in heaven, and we ain't going to have anything to lay at his feet? Are you going to have heavenly crowns? You get to lay them at his feet. Revelation 4, 10 through 11, it says, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. These 24, these 24 elders that it speaks of in this moment, they, these are the ones, they're expressions of all the believers. They're us. There are those that are in Christ, but when we get to heaven, we get to take our crowns, not to look at how great we are, but to get to lay them at our feet as an act of worship for the things that we got to do for the Lord. I want to be able to cast the crowns I've earned at Jesus' feet through my service, but some people won't get to it all. Lord, I pray that that, will, uh, I, that, that that never is allowed to happen to me. And so to keep our minds on the reward that counts, let's look at Colossians 3, 2, since we're over in Colossians chapter 3, and it says... Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Now, that sounds totally opposite of what we think and what we do these days, though, right? We go through life, and all we're worried about is what everybody else thinks, what it's going to do to our social status, what it's going to do to our jobs, how people are going to react to us, if we might hurt somebody's feelings, if we might step on somebody's toes. I don't know. We're thinking about all of these things. But what Paul is writing right here is set your mind on the things above and quit worrying about this all down here. You know why? Because when your mind is up here, the things down here are going to get taken care of. But when your mind is on all the things down here, you completely neglect the only one that can affect the things down here. You've got it so out of perspective. If we have a horizontal view, things will never measure up. They'll always fall short. We'll change our tactics to meet our needs, but when we look vertically, it changes everything. When I look vertically, I can see that there are only two outcomes. Everyone is either receiving the reward of eternity in heaven, or they are receiving the eternal destitute of weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, which is hell. My reward is not just the crowns I get to lay at Jesus' feet. It's also that I get to spend eternity with those that I got to lead to Jesus and those that get to come with me. Paul once said in Acts chapter 20 that he was innocent the blood of all men because he had declared the whole counsel of God to them. That's a man that was focused on the reward. He was innocent of all man's blood. And that's where it comes to us truly serving Jesus. How do you serve? You got to get your mind right. You got to get your mind right. It's not about you, it's about Him. You got to refine what you're doing. You got to know what God desires of you, what He's gifted you with, and how you employ those things that He has given you. And then finally, 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 you need to be focused on the reward. 
It's not about what you gain here on this earth. It's not about how much money you leave this place with. It's not about anything else other than you are serving Jesus and there's a heavenly reward for it. And boy, the bonus to it all is that you get to take somebody with you if you've truly been faithful and led others to Christ. And so as we look at the how to, how to serve, I told you earlier, you may not know where you want to serve. You may not know exactly where God's got you or what he desires of you. But here in just a few minutes, when we close this service, I'm going to ask everybody, if you'll take just a few minutes and walk downstairs and look at the different tables and see the different opportunities that God's already put in your path here in this church, there's many places that you can be serving if you're not right now. You may not have even realized what those opportunities are. But the most important thing, before you ever go trying to serve the Lord, you first got to surrender to Him. Everything goes back to this. If you're absent a relationship with Jesus, and I'm not talking about just knowing who He is. I'm not talking about your mama or your granddaddy or whoever else had a relationship with Him. I'm talking about the individual level. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, service will come, but your surrender has to happen first. Is Jesus Christ your Lord today? You know, I just got to celebrate my salvation anniversary, my, 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 my true birthday. And boy, is that not something special. To be able to go back to a place, to a very moment in my life, where I know that Jesus became part of my life. He wasn't just somebody I'd heard about or somebody I'd went to a church attendance about, not somebody I was raised around anymore. He became personal to me in that moment. But it wasn't, it wasn't just that. There was something that came with it. He changed my life. You can go back and you can look at who I used to be, and you can see who I became. And in that moment that everything changed was Jesus. Do you have that place in your life where you used to be one way and now you're another and the difference was Jesus? If not, you can have that right now. We all need to understand that it begins with this. We are all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us are right. None of us are righteous. No matter what we do, no matter how we try, we can't work our way to heaven. We can't fix it. There's nothing that anybody can do for us. It's a personal decision to choose Jesus because you're a sinner. But the great thing is this, Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin, and this is not the great part, is death. We're all going to have to face that, spiritually and physically. But here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. If he's your Lord, he's already paid the penalty for your sin. No longer do you live in Romans 3, 23. You now live in the life that Jesus has given for you. But it takes that surrender it takes that moment where you say, I can't measure up, God. Will you save me? And you walk away with a new boss in your life, and his name is Jesus. And then you're empowered by his spirit, and you get to serve him for the rest of your days. That's what it's all about, right? Can you go back to that place? If not, come see me here in just a moment. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let him convict you of that sin and let you come to the place of surrender. And allow him to be Lord of your life. Maybe you've had this moment where you had, you've hit that reset button during this service. God got your attention about where your service has been. If it's time for you to do something different, the altar is here. I'm going to tell you this, though. I'm going to get out of the way right now because I can feel that the Holy Spirit wants to touch your heart and wants to move everybody in this place. I'm going to hush. We're going to pray. And I just want you to respond however the Holy Spirit leads you. Let's stand. Father, I love you. I thank you and I praise you. God, I know you've got great plans right here in this moment. God, I pray that we can remove ourselves and God, just focus on you for just a minute. God, you draw us to where we need to be. Let your Holy Spirit convict the lost. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit guides the saved to be everything that you created them to be. And God, let us leave here different for you, changed by you. I thank you for the results that we're about to see through this moment. God, give each person in this place the boldness to respond as you're calling them to. And I thank you for it all. I love you and praise you and ask all of these things in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. Just respond as the Holy Spirit leads you and come.